If you've played a Mario game before in your life, this scene should be pretty familiar. You're happily frolicking about the Mushroom Kingdom, making your way to wherever you're headed. But then, out of nowhere... Ugh, creepy, right? But let's rewind for a second. Listen carefully again. That's a bark. Why is this giant, horrific, toothy chunk of metal barking like a dog? Well, there's actually a very good reason for it, and it's something you really wouldn't expect. Let's take a look. Hi there, welcome to Thomas Game Docs. So today, we're talking about the origin of these creepy things, the Chain Chomps. They've been around for every recent Mario game, giving players around the world horrific chomp-filled nightmares. But where exactly did they come from? Well, first let's track down their origin. Maybe track down is a little melodramatic. Chain Chomp first appearance? They first appeared in Super Mario Bros 3. Okay, well that's our first question answered. The first game that these creatures appeared in is the much revered NES game Super Mario Bros 3. This game brought a multitude of important aspects to the Mario series that would eventually become mainstays. The Tanuki suit, toad houses, the world map. But one aspect which I'm not so keen on is the chain chomp. But that doesn't answer the question of how these things even came about. I mean, they're super weird looking, plus they bark like a dog. So how did the game's developers even come up with these things? Well, to find out, we're going to have to look into a tragic event in the childhood of one of the game's creators. This guy, Shigeru Miyamoto. I would be pretty surprised if you didn't know who he is, but just in case, he is the game designer who birthed Donkey Kong, Super Mario, and Zelda, among many, many others. And when he was younger, he experienced something which scarred him. One day, Miyamoto was outside his house in the small town of Sonobe, Kyoto, where he grew up. Suddenly, a neighbor's dog appeared out of nowhere and started ferociously barking at him. It grew closer and closer, sending shivers down the young Miyamoto's spine. Then it took one final leap, only inches from the boy's face, with its mouth open, teeth glinting in the sunlight. Bam! It was jerked back by its leash. Moments later, Miyamoto opened his eyes. To his amazement, he had escaped totally unharmed. He knew back then that he would never forget that event. Fast forward 25 odd years and Miyamoto was now working as a game designer at acclaimed game development studio Nintendo. The game he was currently producing was Super Mario Bros 3, the third entry in the much revered Super Mario series. The development team, that includes producer Shigeru Miyamoto, co-director Takashi Tezuka and lead programmer Toshihiko Nakago from SRD, this team were currently in the midst of brainstorming new ideas for the game. They started with power-ups. As I've mentioned before, the team first wanted to include a power-up themed around becoming some sort of creature. They liked the idea of including something mythological, eventually settling on a centaur. If you're not up on your Greek mythology, that's a half-human, half-horse. Before long though, the team decided to give it the axe and replace it with a different mythological creature the Japanese Tanuki. Well, to be clear, the Tanuki, or raccoon dog, is a real animal, but it also has an undeniably important place in Japanese folklore. And here's a fun bit of trivia. In folklore, Tanuki use leaves to help them transform, which is why Mario uses a leaf to enter his raccoon form. Now, once the Tanuki suit was decided on, the team added the frog suit, which was also themed around turning into a different creature. After power-ups, the team moved on to enemies. And right away, something jumped out at Shigeru Miyamoto. What if he turned his childhood trauma with the dog on the lead into an enemy in the game? It would be a round sphere with menacing jaws just like the dog way back then. And the enemy would be changed to a post, again, just like his childhood memory. Finally, he would name the enemy after the noise that dogs make in Japan, Wan Wan. In English, this ended up being changed into Chain Chomp. A more literal translation would be calling the enemy a woof woof, which, yeah, maybe doesn't sound quite so menacing. Another new enemy this time around was the Boo, a ghost-like enemy who reacted to the player's own movements. If Mario looked towards the Boo, it would freeze on the spot and not move any closer. 
However, if Mario looked in the other direction, the boo would gradually creep closer and closer, eventually attacking Mario. But how did the team come up with this enemy? Well, the boo's behaviour, especially in Mario 64, was based around the daily life of director Takashi Tezuka. You see, Tezuka would often spend long, long hours at work, beavering away at Nintendo's upcoming games. Meanwhile, his wife at home grew more and more worried, waiting for Tezuka to arrive for the night. And his wife was normally very quiet, but one day, maddened by all the time Tezuka spent at work, she exploded in a rage, giving Tezuka a piece of her mind. That gave the team the idea for an enemy who seems quiet and unassuming, but when Mario looks away, becomes large and menacing. This eventually became the boo. By the way, Tezuka was asked in an interview how his wife felt about being included in the Mario games. His reply? <laughs> she knows. Alright, one final enemy before we wrap up. Although, maybe that's a little misleading. To top it off, we're talking Koopalings, because these guys also have a pretty surprising history. They got their start in a humble place, this simple sketch. You see, in the earliest days of the Mario series, Shigeru Miyamoto, an artist himself, was in charge of drawing up the official artwork of the characters. His version of Mario looked pretty similar to how Mario looks to this day. However, his versions of Peach and Bowser looked very different. I mean, look at Bowser. Ugh. Actually, Miyamoto was inspired by an old anime from 1960 called Alakazam the Great, also known as Journey to the West. There's this ox demon in the film called Shoryu, and this was the source of inspiration behind Miyamoto's drawing of Bowser. However, in the kindest way possible, Bowser looked awful in all sorts of promotional art. I mean, I feel like I'm gonna have nightmares about Potato Head Bowser and his flock of geese cooper. Yeesh. And so, while working on Super Mario Bros. 2 The Lost Levels, Nintendo decided a redesign was in order to iron out some of the kinks in these characters. Taking the lead on this redesign would be acclaimed animator and artist Yoichi Kotabe. Seriously, this guy could not have been more overqualified for his job as a Nintendo artist. He's worked alongside some of Japan's greatest animating talent. Anyway, Kotabe and Miyamoto worked together to update the looks of the Mario series' main characters. For the plumber himself, Kotabe ended up leaving well alone, for the most part. For Princess Peach, or Princess Toadstool as she was known at the time, Kotabe made her taller, and I guess more dainty? But Bowser was the character who required the biggest overhaul. Although he was meant to be the king of the Koopas, Kotabe couldn't help but view him as a hippo. Not very menacing. And so, he worked together with Takashi Tezuka to draw a new design for the fiend. Here's an early sketch they drew. Notice that in the background? This is the earliest sketch of the Koopalings that we have on record. Fast forward to Super Mario Bros 3, and the development team were in need of a group of bosses that the player could fight. Suddenly, Tezuka remembered the sketch that he and Kotabe had drawn. It was perfect, he realised. And so, the group of developers decided that there should be seven of these mini-bosses, one for each world of the game. When designing the characters, they used themselves as inspiration. That's right, the Koopalings were based on Mario 3's developers. Sadly, it's not known which Koopaling was based on which developer, but it's still very entertaining to think about. Now, for the Japanese release of the game, the developers decided to leave the Koopalings, or Kok Koopa as they were known in Japan, unnamed. They were just the Kok Koopa. That was it. However, two years later, Nintendo of America brought the game out in the US. And alongside the cartridge itself, there was this instruction manual. And if we flip to page four, ta-da, they've all magically got names now. So, why did Nintendo give the characters names, and who was responsible for the naming? Well, to find out, we need to look to this guy, Davey Brooks. Now, Brooks started off as purely a Nintendo fan. And, as you'll know if you were an 80s or 90s Nintendo fan, there was this phone number you could call if you needed help with a Nintendo game, called the Power Line. The phone number was 206-885-PLAY and calling this number would get you in touch with a game counsellor, who would help guide you through the game you were stuck on. One day, a young Davy Brooks found himself in need of a little help with the game he was playing. 
after digging through the instruction manual, he found their phone number for the Nintendo power line and gave it a ring. After explaining his problem to the counsellor, they quickly found the solution, and Davy managed to progress through the game. Once he hung up the phone, he thought to himself, that must be the coolest job on the planet. Only a few weeks later, Brooks noticed something in the local newspaper. It was an advert for the very job he had just been admiring, a chance to become a Nintendo game counsellor. Before long, he showed up to the job interview, and it turned out to be shockingly simple. All he needed to have done was played Zelda and Mario, which for a teen in the 80s wasn't very rare. And so, Brooks quickly settled into his job as a Nintendo counsellor. However, before long, an opportunity came up for him. He would be able to move into the product analysis department of Nintendo, which looked over the company's games to help decide how to market them and whether to even bring them over from Japan at all. However, before taking the job, he had to prove himself by writing a review of SimCity for the Mac. It turned out that he wasn't half bad, and he got the job. Now, one of his first tasks was to look over the very roughly translated Japanese from Super Mario Bros. 3 and make it sound more, uh, correct. And he quickly noticed that the Koopalings were left unnamed. Well, that wouldn't do, would it? And so, he got to work, thinking up some names for these characters. Now, Brooks was a big music lover, so this had a major effect on his naming decisions. When looking over the Koopalings, one of them immediately jumped out at him. This guy. His hair looked exactly like the great composer Beethoven, Ludwig van Beethoven. And so, he decided to name the Koopaling Ludwig von Cooper. Von Van? I think he got a little mixed up there. <laughs> oh well, the rest of the Koopalings followed a similar pattern. This little guy had some pretty snazzy glasses, which reminded Brooks of the singer-songwriter Roy Orbison. And so, Roy Cooper was born. Side note, apparently this guy is nicknamed the Big O, which is amazing. Please only refer to me as the Big T from now on. Right, the next Koopaling that Brooks picked out was this one, who reminded him of punk singer Wendy O. Williams. And so, Wendy O. Cooper was the name he chose. Another punk-inspired Koopaling was Iggy Cooper, named after Iggy Pop, the godfather of punk. Next, Brooks picked out this guy, who he saw as a bit of a loudmouth. And so, he named him Morton Cooper Jr., after the loudmouth talk show host Morton Downey Jr. For Larry, there was no real-life inspiration. Brooks just thought that he looked like a Larry. And lastly, Lemmy Cooper. This guy was named after the founder and lead singer of the hugely influential rock band Motorhead, Lemmy Kilmister. And that was all the Cooperlings. Once Brooks had all the names decided on, he sent them over to Nintendo of Japan to check over. Somewhat surprisingly, they were absolutely fine with these names, even though they were inspired by some not-so-kid-friendly sources. And with that, the names were pinned down. That was how it stayed. For the most part. I'll keep this quick before I end the video, but there was this American cartoon adaption of Mario 3, produced by DIC Entertainment, called The Adventures of Super Mario Bros. 3. And in this show, the Koopalings have completely different names. Kind of weird ones as well, I'll rattle them off now. Bully Cooper, Big Mouth Cooper, Kooky Von Cooper, Cheatsy Cooper, Cootie Pie Cooper, and Hip and Hop Cooper. Now, I originally thought that maybe this show aired before the game was released in North America, so they were forced to come up with their own names. But no, this show came out about nine months after the game. Very weird. These names ended up being used again in the Super Mario World American cartoon, but after that, the series spin-offs stuck to their official names. Which I think is a good thing. I mean, Cheatsy Cooper? Cootie Pie Cooper? Big Mouth Cooper? Man, the 90s were weird. Oh, before you go, thanks for the huge amount of support this channel has been receiving over the last week or so. It's been crazy. If you'd like to, follow me on Twitter. That way you'll know ahead of time what videos I have planned. Plus, it's just general good times over there. Alright, see you next week. Bye.